This time I have the privilege of introducing our next panel. And this is a great panel to me because it talks about the inventor who becomes an entrepreneur. And that's what we're talking about on this panel. Moving from inventor to entrepreneur. We have a great panel. I'm going to introduce your moderator, Elizabeth Doherty. Elizabeth, I'll let you introduce your panel. Thank you, Sean. And just as Sean uh, has asked you to fill out your surveys and hopefully uh, in a positive fashion, we are not only celebrating uh, Friday the 13th today, we are celebrating National Positive Thinking Day. Oh, yes. Now, I know. On that note, <laughs> I just want to add one more positive experience for everyone. If you could all remember to silence your cell phones, that would help us have a more positive experience today as well. You're the best. <laughs> well, it's my pleasure to welcome you back after lunch. And as many of you know, this is kind of a tough spot in the agenda to have. The spot that's right after lunch, um, you may start getting that afternoon sleepy. So we're going to do something together as a group prior to starting our panel. So I'm going to ask everybody to stand up. Does it involve wiggling? It might. So we've all heard of the YMCA, right? We've all been to a wedding or an event where we've done the YMCA. Mm -hmm. All right, well, we have our own version here at the USPTO, and it's the USPTO. Oh, oh, for the So love. we're going to do this together to get a little stretch in our afternoon to make sure we're all awake, because this is going to be an incredibly invigorating panel. And I want to make sure that you hear each and every word of our fantastic speakers. So let's do it together. U S. P, T, O. Thank you. I love it. I only needed music. I only like needed the music. big Fig Newton dance. Yes, that's next. And then there will be the chicken dance before we end the day. Oh, I could do that. See, who says intellectual property isn't fun? It's good stuff. It's good stuff. <laughs> So taking what you've learned this morning and building upon it, we are now going to spend the next hour discussing the road from inventor to entrepreneur. It's estimated that there are nearly 29 million small businesses in America and that they employ nearly 57 million people. So when we say small business it's, is the lifeblood of the economy, one can truly appreciate what that means. So do you think you have what it takes to start a small business? Do you think you can start, build, and grow a business based upon your intellectual property? We have some very esteemed experts here today to help <laughs> us analyze that question. Their bios are in your materials, so I will not read their bios to you. But we have, uh, seated in the middle, uh, Daria Trujillo, who is the Chief Merchandising Officer of SLC Holdings. Howie Bush, to my immediate right, inventor and entrepreneur, and Jose Calici Rios, uh, Southern Regional Manor for the National Institute of Standards and Technology, which if you're not familiar with NIST, they are headquartered in Gaithersburg, Maryland, not far from here, and are our sister agency in the Department of Commerce. So please help me in welcoming them, and I hope that you'll actively participate in our discussion today. I'd like to ask each of the panelists, because while you have their bios, I would like to ask each of the panelists to share your 30-second soundbite as to your role or place in the invention innovation ecosphere. In other words, what experience brings you here today to help our audience? Go ahead. Go ahead. You want me to go? Yeah. Wow. Um, They're kind and generous. <laughs> so I've, I've invented and developed products. Uh, I've licensed products. I did a Kickstarter, successful Kickstarter campaign. Uh, I've also coached and helped other inventors and product developers get their products to market. And after I did my Kickstarter campaign, I ended up on Shark Tank. And uh, so I, I kind of... Uh, have touched a lot of different areas in the inventing and innovation space between licensing, develop, you know, developing products, and now manufacturing and, and running my company that I was on Shark Tank for, which is Dude Robe. A cooler dude. bathrobe for guys. The Dude. Dara? Dude. Yes, thank you. 
Um, I spent 15 years at the Walt Disney Company, one of the most creative companies, as you know, in the world. Um, but I was actually on your side during those 15 years, which meant I came up with concepts, ideas, sometimes a physical, tangible product, sometimes an experience, and had to spend time in the boardroom trying to pitch my, con my concept. So I clearly know what it's like to get the no and go back time and time again until I got that yes. After that five years, I worked at HSN, Home Shopping Network, where I was vice president of new business development and the American Dreams program, which oversaw entrepreneurs across the world trying to come in and sell their products. I would go find them, they would come find me, and sometimes when their products weren't ready, but we loved them enough, I worked with them until we got them what we called camera ready versus retail ready. Now, I'm the chief merchandising officer for SLC, which is an angel investment firm. And we go out and we find entrepreneurs who need funding, who need factoring, who need an investment, and we help them not only get retail ready, then I take them and get them into retail. <laughs> You're not done. <laughs> Go yeah, on, my yeah, friend. Yeah, go I don't want to follow that. I'm just saying. <laughs> Thanks yeah. for letting me go first. They always do that to me. They bring all these incredible panel people to them, and then I have to kind of be humble. Uh, <laughs> good afternoon. Uh, a couple of things. Uh, the reason I ended up in this job as the resource manager with NIST was because I had manufacturing experience with a chemical plant. A chemical plant is not your typical small and medium manufacturer, but in my role, I actually interacted a lot with small suppliers, you know, the catalyst, the pump. So I, I had some experience qualifying those. So that, that gave me an edge with regard to the position that I have right now. Now the question is, what do I do right now? Well, I think Elizabeth mentioned there's like 20 something million small businesses. Uh, we only deal with a subset of that. Our, our centers, we have 50 plus one. Uh, 50, in every state, we have a center that provides services to manufacturers, and Puerto Rico is the one. And what we do is we help uh, companies to survive, basically maintain their operation, or grow. So those are the three components that we do. Depending on the database that you look at, there are approximately in the U.S., 300,000 manufacturers up to a million. Yeah. <laughs> it's a really tricky situation counting those things, but that, that's kind of the, the number versus the 20-something million, which incorporates every single business around. So the reason I'm here is because when you have decided, I'm going for it. I mean, I, I really want to manufacture this. That's where we come in. I call it basically in the tail end of the pipeline. So you, you need to have your business plan. You know what you're going to do. And then now our centers, every state, and you know, I'm here like if you want to talk to me about what are the possibilities in Michigan or in South Carolina or whatever, I can give you some guidance with regard to like, you know, what would be the best center that can collaborate with you in every aspect with regard to let's manufacture this. I'll tell you right now, even though we have 50 plus one, they're not all the same. So you may be living in Montana and South Dakota, and then I'll tell you, well, are you willing to go to another place to manufacture depending on your flexibility? So I'm here open, like any question that you may have, if you are kind of ready to say, I'm going for it, I think it's a great idea, we need to manufacture, I can provide you some, some insight into what kind of service you, our centers can give you at that point. You know, the fun fact that Jose failed to share with you is that he spent part of his career here as a U.S. patent examiner. Yeah. So we still consider him one of our own. And they still <laughs> invited me back. <laughs> <laughs> it speaks very highly of his talents. Um, Howie, let's start with you. As an inventor and as the inventor on our panel, what self-assessment did you undertake to determine whether or not you wanted to try to make that transition from inventor to entrepreneur? So first of all, one of the things I didn't say before is like, I'm one of you guys. And probably that's an insult to you guys, no offense, <laughs> because, because I can't make anything. So I'm an inventor. I'm not like, I really, I can't make anything yet. Somehow I'm able to get products to market. And I never wanted to manufacture anything. So I really enjoyed being the developer and creator and then giving it to somebody else who's already you know, in the marketplace, has you know, retail distribution, I don't have to worry about inventory risk and 
some, somebody may be raising tariffs, you know, and, and causing all sorts of issues. I was, I was happy doing what I was doing and doing it the way I was doing it. I don't know that I would say it was quite such a self-assessment, although it is important to note that not everybody should become, you know, the entrepreneur and run their own business and take on that inventory risk. And, and you have to think about it based on your life, your job, your, your resources, both financial and time. But I, for me, I came up with this idea for a product that, which is a cooler bathrobe for guys that I knew I couldn't license. I knew I couldn't get a patent for it. I did get a trademark. Since we're at the Patent Trademark Office, I should probably add that in. Um, and the, the trademark was really important, but the patent just wasn't going to happen. So I knew I could license it. And, you, and apparel is typically difficult to license. So rather, as much as I didn't do a self-assessment, I literally I said, let me try it with a Kickstarter, see what it's like. If it's successful, I'll know if I have something. It was a great way to test the product and see. And I did, and literally a week into me doing a Kickstarter, Shark Tank reached out to me, and I kind of got pushed into it, I'll be honest with you. Like, once you go on Shark Tank, it's hard not to continue with that product. You have success, you have like all the marketing in the world from being on Shark Tank, and we're gonna talk, I'm gonna be on another panel, a Shark Tank panel later, so we'll get more into the Shark Tank aspect of it, but I don't Way know to whet that I, their appetite, Howie. Yeah, I like but, it. No, but, but I don't know that I, did, you know, I had confidence in myself, but I would say very few of the people that I know, and I have a pretty big ecosystem of inventors and product developers and, and people who run their businesses because of it, did they really do a self-assessment? It just kind of organically happens, and you figure out how to do the books or, or find someone to do it, and you figure out how to get the social media done and the marketing and things like that. You all have it within you. You just have to you know, be prepared and just you know, be really resilient. But, so Howie, along those lines, you mentioned using Kickstarter as one barometer of whether or not to go forward. Were there other resources or mentors, um, you know, perhaps a small business development center in your area? Were there others who said, yeah, you should go for it? Or, wow, you really got to think twice about this. Were there, did you have a, a great self-help book? Were there other things that you looked to that you found helpful or that you might recommend? Yeah, have, have, have a lot of... Keep talking, my friend. Yeah. <laughs> this is, guys, this is teamwork. Um, <laughs> You, you really, I, I didn't have, I don't know that I had like a mentor, but I have my network of people that I'll bounce ideas off of. And, you know, mind you, you can't just take what they say at face value, right? Especially if it's friends. Some are going to tell you, yeah, it's great because they love you and they just want to say that. Some people just like to knock things down. But I think a lot of it, you, you, you put it out, you see, you look in people's eyes when you tell them about it or show it to them. I mean, the biggest thing I did was when I got my prototype made, just telling people about it is one thing. When I got the prototype made, when I had the idea, when I finally like, figured out what it should look like and what I wanted it to do, I literally jumped out of the shower, got dressed, ran to Walmart, bought six towels, ran to my tailor and said, can you make a hoodie and pants out of this? And a week later I had it and I'm like, you know what, this is even cooler than I thought. And then I showed that to people, and just looking in their eyes, like, like their, are, their eyes aren't gonna lie. You could say, what do you think of it? You'd be like, oh, it's really cool. Yeah. You know, but you could really tell. And I think having that network, and not just living in your own head, is the most important thing for when you come up with an idea, you know. But, but also have some courage to your convictions. Does anyone else here think that Howie should be wearing the dude robe right now. <laughs> Told him. I, I, Come I mean, back next year, folks. <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying. Um, Howie, before we turn away and uh, give someone else uh, an opportunity to, to speak, you specifically said that not every inventor is destined to become an entrepreneur. Are there things that you would think that might be um, red flags or, or skill sets that people should think um, to evaluate themselves as to whether they, they are that person or not. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a, so first of all, I'll say it's never been easier time to 
become both an inventor and the entrepreneur, mm -hmm. thanks to Amazon, thanks to Alibaba, thanks to Facebook marketing, thanks to Kickstarter. You can really put things up and test things really inexpensively. And, and there are survey things, survey monkey and things like that you can use to survey random people or your Facebook friends or whatever. Um, but in terms of skill sets and whatever, I, th I think it goes back to what I said before. Do you have the resources, both financial, um, do you have the time, which is a resource, mm -hmm. do you have the bandwidth? I think at the end of the day, um, you have to be willing, first of all, you need to be optimistic and you need to be willing to persevere and fight through everything because you will hit bumps in the road. And if you're a person, I guess I would say, if you're a person who's gonna have a bump in the road or somebody's gonna say no and that's gonna stop you, don't become an entrepreneur because mm -hmm. you will have to pivot, you will have to, it's not gonna all go. I got lucky when, frankly, I would not have applied for Shark Tank. They came to me, I'm like, all right, if you're gonna ask me, I'll go. But I knew I wasn't, I didn't think I was ready to go on Shark Tank. My company was one week old, for God's sakes. I didn't, when I filmed on Shark Tank, I didn't have any product, but it's my willingness, and this is what I think is, You'll hear more in, this, in the Shark Tank group, but I, I notice like a common thread of a lot of the people who are in Shark Tank and who were very successful is that they're willing to take these risks. And, and sure, they should be calculated risks, but you have to be willing to take risks and you have to fight through everything no matter what is thrown in your way. And you have to be willing to just deal with it. I, I want to jump in there just yeah, really please, quickly please. because you mentioned something that I think will help the audience when you said Shark Tank found you. So one of the benefits that I had working for the Walt Disney Company is that they also <coughs> owned ABC. When Shark Tank first began, how many of you watched season one? A few of you did. How many of you were kind of scratching your head because th there was like no one that you knew other than maybe, maybe Kevin Harrington who did As Seen on TV? Little known fact, I was sitting off to the side on the set for the first two years doing this. <laughs> if you go back and watch episodes, you'll see every now and then some of these. Just looking, just what she's saying, what she's saying. Because of retail. Fast forward now, how do they find their products? People used to line up, come in, serve them up, get picked, go on the show. Now, because of social media, because of Kickstarter, because of Indiegogo, because of Amazon, the entire Shark Tank crew is searching for new entrepreneurs and new products. So many of you are scared to put your product out there because you're afraid either someone's going to knock you off or you're not really ready. I am going to suggest to you, if you want to be one of those discovered people, that entrepreneurs, you take that leap of faith. You get out there. You put it on Amazon. First and foremost, your audience who you don't even know is gonna tell you if they like your product. They're gonna do that, do that with orders. But then just to know at trade shows and social media, the Shark Tank crew is out there actively and aggressively every day looking for entrepreneurs. And so unlike lining up at the door, now they're placing the phone calls to people. So just a little uh, bit of inside scoop. I, I wanna add something to that. You know, what, something you said was so true and, it, and I've had so many inventors say to me, well, you got lucky. And what I would say is exactly what you're saying. Because I put it out there, the luck found me. Found you. And you have to take that step. If you just sit with this idea in your head, and you're like, it's too important. I can't tell anybody. They have to sign an NDA. I don't want to put it out there. I don't want to do anything. And I'm not telling you to not protect yourself. Be right. smart about it. But if you don't put it out there, the luck will not find you. So That's how you get lucky. This is incredibly great insight. And I think what you're saying in a sense, Howie and Dara, is in a sense you're creating your own luck. 100%. You are positioning your yourself to, uh, for that success. Um, Dara, let's, let's jump to you. As someone no, no, who, I'm not done about me. Tell them, no, <laughs> well, I know I'm this kidding, is kidding, about me. you. Trust this me, should I'm have been the dude guys. robe <laughs> session. I'm sick of me too, don't worry. I love you. We'll, we'll get back to the dude. No doubt, uh, there's lots of time for our conversation today. Um, Dara, as someone who facilitates the creation of successful entrepreneurs, um, Howie's already touched on what makes for a successful entrepreneur 
Can you think or would you suggest to add additional characteristics, traits, or key ingredients you would look for someone that you are going to help bring forward? Someone that catches your eye, whether you see them on social media, whether you see them at a trade show, that you say, that person's got it. What is the it that catches your eye? I love it. Such a great question. So there's really only two factors when it comes to being an entrepreneur or an inventor, and it's the person and the product. So if I'm at a trade show where I can see and hear people, I look for the person first. The person who has personality, who is effervescent, who's not afraid to talk, who's not afraid to ask me to come over to their booth. It is all about your personality. And I love, I love every possible personality test that tells me that I'm an extrovert or an introvert. If you are in this room and you are an introvert, learn how to become an extrovert for the sake of the success of your product. You can go back home, you can close the doors, you can put the blinds down, that's absolutely fine. You can turn off your cell phone, you cannot speak to another person until the next trade show. But the moment you go into that trade show, you need to really dig deep down and show your personality. I think that's the session how he's teaching at five. <laughs> <laughs> Stole your thunder. No. So that's the person. The second thing, though, is the product. And I will tell you there's kind of three components to the product. And every entrepreneur needs to know this. Number one, features and benefits. So let me just quickly tell you. A feature is something you can physically see. So don't spend your time telling me, look at this beautiful purple stapler. OK, I can see that it's a purple stapler. Look, if I squeeze it like this, staples come out. I see that. What I need to know are the benefits. So number one, as an entrepreneur, if you have a few seconds to grab someone's attention, you need to tell me what the benefits are of your product that I can't see. I have no earthly idea that the stapler puts invisible staples down. And you can't ever see it, so don't ever have to worry about your beautiful piece of work looking like it's got this big metal hook in there. No, you, they're invisible. Or whatever that benefit is, I can't see until you tell me about it. I can't see that this beautiful cream is going to make me look 15 years younger if I use it for three weeks. I can't see it. But you can tell me about the benefits. So you need to know your benefits. Second, when you're talking to people, is from a product perspective, is you have to know are you a brand new product or are you newly reimagined? It's OK to be reimagined. It's OK to look at something and go, I can make that better, or I can make it more functional for me. It's OK. Remember the microwave? When it first started out, it was like this big. <laughs> now you can buy them so tiny, they're like a toaster. But it's a microwave. Someone continued to come around and reinvent it and make it better. It's OK. But if it's truly new, and it's like, you've never seen anything like it. There's nothing like it on the market. Please do your research. Because nowadays, it's very hard to say that nothing like this exists. So if it's reimagined, tell me what the benefits are that makes yours a little bit different than somebody else. The last thing, is it a need or is it a, is it a want? You need to have it because it problem solves. I worked on this thing because my, my child kept dropping their pacifier, and it was such a problem for me when I would go out that I created this connector between the pacifier and the bib. Now that's a need. Any woman out there is going to need to have that for her child. But a want, do I want all the hangers in my closet to look the same color? I might because I'm a little OCD that way. So yeah, I might want to go out and buy a brand new pack of hangers when I already have them in my closet, but it's because now I can match them all with a great color. Just need to know, are you going to be that tangible, desirable, I have to have it because it solves a problem? Or it's OK to be that impulse buy because it's a want. And every now and then, we all buy stuff that we're like, oh, that's cool. I'll just get it. And you never use it. It's OK. So those are kind of the things that I look for, that we look for, the personality, and then those elements of the product. Can, can I put a point on no. one thing you just said, <laughs> which is, but I don't want you guys to be scared. Like, if you have a product that's not in a white space, that's brand new, that nothing like it exists, that's OK. Like, yeah. many of the best-selling products are just a, a slight improvement over something else that's already out there. Exists. So don't be afraid of that. Correct. And I will tell you, 
Working at HSN for five years, there was rarely anything that I saw that was brand new. But reimagined, that gives us something to talk about. Oh, I know all of you have a toaster at home, but I guarantee you, your toaster can't spit out something that makes it look like it's Mickey Mouse on the front. Yeah. Brand spanking new to the consumer. Yeah, look at you. <laughs> you own the toaster? No, I, I know the company. He knows the company. <laughs> Sarah, it sounds like in your experience, um, both at HSN, at Disney, and doing the work that you do now, you have probably helped hundreds, if, if not thousands, of inventors and entrepreneurs. <laughs> do you have a particular success story that you think could really bring home for our audience, um, not only how you can help people, but how somebody can grow through this process and become successful? That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a great question, because you're right probably a thousand or so more in five years. Um, success stories. I am very proud to say there's been a lot of them. I think maybe a couple that come to mind, um, there's a great lady that I'm actually working with right now. Her name is Stacy. About a year ago, I met Stacy. She was slightly overweight, and she was talking to me about the product she had in her mind. She had just gone to the doctor's office, high cholesterol. She's, you know, I know I need to lose weight, da, da, da. Someone had mentioned to her, go vegan. So she goes, so I'm trying it, you know. So I, in my mind, I'm like, if this really works, I'm a chef. So maybe I'll make some vegan recipes. Fast forward a year later, and I see Stacy. She came to this event that I had that's called, it was called um, the American Dreams Academy. And she came, and she comes up to me, and I barely recognized her. She must have lost almost 100 pounds. And she said, remember that idea I told you about? I said, yes. She goes, well, I created Simple Vegan. And what I did is I went on this vegan diet. And then I, what I discovered is there's not a lot of desserts for vegan that are purely vegan, everything from the egg substitute to icing. She goes, so I decided I'm going to make desserts. I want an indulgent. I'm going to make brownies. I'm going to make cakes. I'm going to make chocolate chip pancakes. Like She was so into this found a co-packer, created the recipes, created the product, and put in my hands the most unbelievable carrot cake when she was standing in front of me. She goes, you gotta try it. And if it's not the best carrot cake you've ever had, she says, I'm gonna take you out for a steak dinner. Well, I was hungry. <laughs> I wanted that bet. I ate it right there. And I couldn't look her in the eye and tell her that it wasn't the best carrot cake I had ever had. So now we took her underneath our wing. We just got a massive purchase order for Walmart, and she will be, as of spring, nice. in Walmart as okay. Simple Vegan. I love that. Lisa, can I mention? Please, please, Jose. Yeah, one comment, well, regarding helping people and also the mentor. Uh, I come from a family of public servants. I mean, my mother was probably the, uh, the token person as a public servant. I think I, I inherited that. So m my motivation and with regard to being in this job is actually not as much the manufacturing component, but the fact that we help people. And uh, how many of you are actually thinking of sending it to manufacturing? I mean, you're in the manufacturing phase now thinking, I, I want to make it. Anybody raise their hand just to see where are you right now, just to get a feel, because I got some advice for you. OK, the, the thing about our program is called Manufacturing Extension Partnership. The extension component, for those of you that don't know, it has to do with the greater good. You know, extension programs in the U.S. are established because the nation needs that for the benefit of the communities adjacent to whatever the program is established. So there's an agricultural extension and there's also manufacturing extension. What I do, and this is one of my biggest motivation, is I like to help those communities that actually are in need of the federal government helping them to be able to grow and survive. Those communities right now, they are called rural. So. And you know, we forget the political aspects of all this, but rural communities, if you are thinking with regard to manufacturing something in the US, think very closely of like, you know, if I go to a rural community, probably every single state have additional benefits to you to establish basically a facility there. It's not easy. It's easier to put a facility close to metro than it is rural. But from my perspective, let me tell you, if you go to one of those communities, and we have a few of them, that you have 35, 40% of the employees in that particular community are working either one or two manufacturing facilities. You close down that factory, you must well lock down the, 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 the town and send them over to a metro area. 
So one of the things that I would like to suggest for the greater good, I mean, if you really want to help people, become part of those communities. You'll love it. I mean, I had a lot of experience with those communities when, in my previous lifetime as a professor. I mean, just the, the, uh, the benefit of feeling that you're doing something for others. And by the way, you'll make money too. I mean, this is not something for doing it, but you make money. So if, you wanna, if you're at that stage where you're thinking, you know, where should I put my facility? Let me know, because that is a strong advantage to be thinking of areas like that. And you know, if you look at the whole highway system of the, of the US, rural communities most likely will have a highway or you know, very close to it. So it's a matter of transportation of maybe a truck or something that will get your material to wherever you gotta, you gotta take it. So, so that's my comment with regard to helping people. And you know, here I am, if you really wanna talk about that stage, I can help you with that. Jose, yeah. let's use this as a jumping off point to actually talk about the NIST Manufacturing Extension Partnership Centers, these 51 yeah. centers that you've spoken about. Yeah. How does someone in our audience today know that they are in a position to be ready to come and use your services, and what kind of services do you have available? The first thing you do is you come to me and I'll give you my business card. <laughs> <laughs> Easy uh, enough. I mean, that's, I got him. I mean, you want to, you want to. I'll you, vouch for him. He gave me one last year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I return your call. Yes. Yeah, yeah. They return your call. See, uh, the thing about it is I'm the resource manager for like 13 states. I, I, I'm normally southeast, but I, you know, I do the whole U.S. Right now, because of a situation, I actually have the two extremes. I have Alaska and Puerto Rico. So, I mean, I'm talking about the whole range. So, what, what I do is like you come to me and say, hey, uh, I, I'm thinking seriously of manufacturing something. I said, oh, any preference for a state? <laughs> you know, you, you want to be in your state or something. And then I said, well, that state, this is basically the center, the capabilities that they have. It may not fit what you need. <laughs> but then I said, how flexible are you? Because I have other states that the, their clients are maybe in the sector, like, you know, if you have an apparel. I, have, I, I can show you the percentage of services every state is providing in apparel. So you want to go to that center that will tell you everything they need to know about providing services in that sector. You want to be part of the supply chain of automotive. You know, you have a great idea for a seat in an automobile. I can tell you right now what are the states that are providing services, and they're not providing it to four General Motors. They're providing it to the little guys that are making one part of that seat. So again, my recommendation to you is come to me and then I'll kind of do the filtering telling you this is you know, some of the centers. And I may actually do an email sending, connecting you to that center so you can start the conversation. Our website is pretty good too. I, I, don't want, I hate it when people say, oh, go to the website. You, know, you can do that, but <laughs> come to me first. I don't mind. I, I'm a spammer, as how he knows. I'll, I'll spam <laughs> you to death, so be careful with that. So that, that would be my recommendation. <laughs> Jose, um, can you speak to what perhaps some of the pitfalls are in manufacturing? Maybe the obvious, but then more importantly, the less obvious pitfalls. Where, where do people get themselves in trouble when they consider starting manufacturing or find themselves knee deep in manufacturing and say, oh no, I, I never realized. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this conversation, I probably should let Howie answer because we had a big conversation about this last year, but let me, I'll answer Howie, is that okay with you? Yes. <laughs> Normally, you have three options. You know, when you're, gonna when you're thinking of manufacturing, you go like, hey, I'm Superman, Superwoman, I'm gonna do it myself. We kind of go like, yeah, really? You really wanna do that? I mean, that's a lot of things for somebody that has never done manufacturing before. But is that what you want? Our center will sit with you and say, okay, what do you want to do? You're going to need this equipment, you need this space, and they'll help you work out basically the facility doing it from scratch because you really want to do it yourself. Normally, if you're not a manufacturer, what well, we will tell you, how about contract manufacturing? You know, will you feel comfortable doing a contract? Obviously, the margins are different because now suddenly you're dealing with somebody else. And this, and this center, they know who are the contract manufacturers in their state. And they cannot, because of liability issues, tell you use this one, they'll give you a list. So they'll give you these three or four are serious, you can contact them. And then as everything else, there's the middle of the road. You can say, no, you know, Jose, 
there's some things that I really need to do. My, I don't trust other people to do it because they're going to steal it from me. But there are other things in the manufacturing process that, you know, they're basically out there. So what you can do is like a hybrid, saying, I'm going to be doing contract manufacturing for some of the pieces, and then I'm going to make some of myself, and then maybe you want to be the integrator, picking everything up and then integrate it. So those are more or less the three options when you come on in. And the reality of it, you know, for you to realize what can you do, and I think both of them, Dara and, uh, and how we have mentioned, know who you are, know where you want to be, and get into the reality of like, you know, you may not be the right person to manufacture this. You may be the right person with the idea, and then basically get the team together. So that would be my recommendation. One of the mistakes that I've noticed, because again, I've seen so many products, is sometimes you'll have an entrepreneur who is so close to the vest with their product, he or she doesn't want to let anybody in. They feel like they've got it all figured out. Yeah. They turn around, they go to a manufacturer, and they get 5,000 of them made because that is where their price break came in. And they mortgaged their house, or they took out a loan, or they put it on a credit card. And then the first opportunity they have to get that product in front of a buyer who could change their life that's when they start getting the feedback. Well, your packaging needs to change, and gosh, if this was about three inches smaller, and you know what, if you could change the front of this to be more opaque when you start hearing these changes, and you're thinking, I have 5,000 of these sitting in my garage, and they want me to make changes. <laughs> what I always recommend is find a way to produce 25 of those items. Mm -hmm. Go sit at a trade show, go to a farmer's market, go to a first Friday someplace, go out and put that product out in front of other people, not your best friend and your parents. They love you. <laughs> and they're going to tell you, it's perfect, just the way it is. And then you got 5,000 out in your garage that you can't sell. Love the family, leave them alone. Have you seen American Idol? All those people who make it through, their family thought they could sing. I'm just warning you, right? We're all like, she bang, she bang. I don't know what she banging, but she got, he got on television. Someone said that he could sing. So the same thing is with your product. I know that they are your babies, and I know that you love them. The best thing you can do for yourself as an entrepreneur is listen to your audience, know your audience, and listen to an expert if you have the opportunity of getting in front of somebody. Don't argue with them if they start saying, well, quite honestly, this would be better on a shelf and I could sell more of them if you did it this way. Don't try to convince them that the way that you've done it is right. You have to, and, and how we use the phrase, which is something I do when I do a keynote, the word is pivot. You have to be able to pivot, have to be able to. Huh. In order to survive in this industry, you have to be able to pivot. So go out, make sure people like your product before you go to the step of fully manufacturing it. Then you'll have a great comfort level that what you're putting your hard earned money in is going to sell. And, and by the way, to that point, even if you, let's just say it's gonna cost you triple the price. Yes. So let's say it's gonna cost you $75 instead of $25 per unit. You're way better off spending $75 for 20 of them than, you know, <laughs> $25 for 5,000 5, of them. Because that's yeah. usually your price break. Everyone always goes, oh, well, if you could buy 5,000, I'll give it to you for this. Right. Well, who came well. up with that number? <laughs> I don't know. So to use uh, Dara's word, before we pivot to audience questions, I have one final question for the panelists, and then I'd like to open it up to your questions. I'd like to ask each panelist, what is your refrigerator magnet message or even a homework assignment that you have for audience attendees today. <laughs> okay. So my refrigerator magnet says, and I'll try to give you a little bit of why, it says no, K-N-O-W, the no, N-O. You have to know the no. So when someone comes in and tells you no, you are okay to ask them why. Don't just be like, okay, I'm going to take my toys and go home. Someone says, no, it's just not right for me. Well, can you tell me why? Their simple thing could be, I've got too many things that are purple. Isn't that an easy fix? Perfect, I can make it in blue. But if you didn't know that, you wouldn't have served it up and you might not have saved your sale. You have to know the reason why you are getting a no. 
My homework assignment is for all of you to spend one hour on the computer and one hour in a retail shop researching who your competitors are, especially if you think your product doesn't exist. Research it on the internet, find out who they are, write down everything that you know to be true about them, things you can see as a feature and things that you can't see that might be a benefit that they might list, and be able to tell me why you're different from your competitor. Go to the retail shop, look at where your product should fit on a retail shelf. If you're in health and beauty, if you're in food, if you're in apparel, take your product with you. I've done this before with people's product. I'll go in the grocery store, I'll go down, like I did with Simple Vegan, I'll go down, I kind of cleared out the Duncan Hines, I put Simple Vegan in the middle, and I just took a look. Do I look like everybody else? What am I doing to stand out? What is she going to do to stand out? Look at price points of your competitor. Another big mistake that entrepreneurs make is thinking, this is the coolest thing since sliced bread. People will spend $99 for it. Your competitor is out there for $49. Yes, they're probably making 100,000 units of that at $49, but you're never going to survive at $99. So all of this information you can get when you go out and you really start to look and see who your competitors are and where you fit in a retail environment. No, you're no. Excellent advice. Yeah, my advice to you, actually, um, when I was in ninth grade, I'm here by a miracle, by the way. My, I had peritonitis, it, it, the whole thing exploded, and they, they never got it. And they managed miraculously to recover. I mean, I managed to recover. I was still young. And while recovery, I was watching this TV program. This lady, she was in the cosmetic business, and they were interviewing this really, very nice, elegant lady. And they asked her, uh, you know, you, this is a very competitive business, cosmetics, and this is, I'm, I'm talking, you know, way back in the 70s, and I, uh, how, how come you have survived so long in this business, you know, being so competitive? And I never forget what that, this is, you got to remember, you know, way back then, three TV programs, you're talking Puerto Rico here, <laughs> so I mean, there's nothing to watch, so I'm watching this stuff, and the lady answered, I'll never forget that. You know, like they, she was in Spanish, but she goes, you know, como dicen en inglés, you know, love me or hate me, but don't forget me. And that lady just suddenly established. That's why, for example, you, you see this? One year from now, you're going to remember, like, yeah, there was this fat guy with a hat on. You know, you, you had no idea what I said, but you know that the, I was here. So the same thing to you, you know, and I think how we said the network, you know, build, build that network. People have to know who you are. And good or bad, or I mean, don't go to jail, obviously, but you know, try, try, try to do this. <laughs> but but my recommendation is, you, you gotta get into that network. You gotta go, you gotta get to know people. They have to know who you are. And you know, like I said, love me or hate me, but don't forget me. So that's that's my recommendation to you. Okay. And the <laughs> and they don't do anything illegal. <laughs> and that's yeah, the yeah, I'm secondary, a federal employee, so. <laughs> secondary refrigerator. Magnet. Sean will kill everybody. <laughs> Howie, bring us home. <laughs> By the way, you can go to prison if you have a prison-related product there you go, and you want to so put it and see how it looks in there. Figure out how to jailbreak. That's, go. That's, that's I, another special I, session. I think, yeah. I think my magnet would be don't wait for perfect. Yeah. I think that too many inventors and especially, do we have a lot of engineers by trade here? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you guys especially because I've coached many and I cannot believe the perfection they're looking for, yeah. for a prototype, and, and in a sell sheet, and in a video. And I'm like, look, this is good enough to get the idea across, and I'm talking about for licensing in this particular instance. You, you gotta get this out there. Like, right. and, and I yeah. think part of it is, you know, afraid of stepping out of your comfort zone, afraid of getting the no, but I would rather get the no's and then move on to the next thing, rather than keep waiting and tinkering and perfecting and getting it. You will, like when I when I launched my when I first did Dude Robe, it wasn't perfect. I definitely did not have it perfect. But I will tell you, I got it up. I got it on there. I could have changed things a million times, but at some point you get it as good as you can, mm -hmm. and then get going. Do not let that hold you back. Exactly. That's Excellent. what I would say. That's yeah. good. Excellent advice so from true. all of you. So I, I would now like to take our last, um, we have almost 15 minutes to take audience questions. So I'd like to encourage and... Uh, There's one, whoa. <laughs> please, uh, I know we have microphones here wow. uh, in the audience that uh, we will be asking that you use a microphone to ask your question. 
Um, and in asking your question, if you want a specific panelist to answer it, please identify the panelist. Well, uh, Jose, <laughs> um, at the, I'd like to ask everyone questions, but I'll give up the microphone. Um, today you said about manufacturing issues. I might be at a point where I could manufacture, but I don't have a business plan. Would you speak to people? At what point in their idea do you speak to people? Do we need to have it pretty much set? Or will you, because when you said you could tell us what we need to manufacture, that's huge. That would give me an idea of costs and needs and things like that. So, do you understand my question? Sure, no, I get it. <laughs> I'm going to actually send that, the, the answer to them. But just for us, for example, our centers, at that point, you're too early in the stage to be talking to our center because they're there when you already have this business plan developed. What normally we would do, a lot of our centers have collaborations with other agencies that can provide basically guidance in how to do that. And then once they go there, then they come up with a plan and say, yeah, this makes sense, the marketing makes sense, some pre uh, preliminary estimates on how much it's going to cost. So that, that would be, from our perspective, uh, from our centers, what, what they would do. I don't know, maybe Howie or Daryl, where you want to comment on with regard to having a business plan, how critical it is, and when, I guess. I, I'm not a big business plan fan fan in general. Listen, if you're going out and raising private equity and stuff like that, venture capital, have a business plan if you're doing a whole business around it. But if you have a product that you're coming out with, I feel like a business plan, I'm not saying, listen, I don't think a business plan is bad, but I wouldn't let that hold me up yeah. because you're not going to know what's going to happen. Just kind of have a game plan. I would, I would do a game plan, but I wouldn't do a whole drawn out business plan. Yeah. I wouldn't. Yeah. yeah, and it totally depends what avenue you're going. So if you're going and looking for an angel investor, he or she, my boss, Sandy, who owns SLC, is going to want to see that business plan yeah. because she's going to want to know, no different than your Shark Tank judges, they're going to want to know what is that return on my investment going to be like and how long is it going to take me to get there based on either prior performance of the product, industry standards that are out there, or sometimes it is just a gut. Sometimes you look at something like the Snuggie and you're like, it's a gut that that's probably going to work. People are going to like it. So you have to have that. But if you're looking at going into like a Target or a Walmart or even on Home Shopping Network, HSN, and you just have a product, that's all that you need. You just need a really great product that someone looks at and says, love it, I'm going to cut you a PO. Then you have to worry about now where am I going to get it fully manufactured and how long will it take? Nice. Yeah, this question is for Dara. Now, when you take somebody under your wing, what type of uh, basically breakdown, breakup do you have? Uh, what do you expect from them as far as investment is concerned? Um, I will absolutely tell you that it is case by case. Totally depends. Mm -hmm. Depends upon where you are in the product pipeline and how much work has to be done. We've had people like Stacy who have come in going, I have this great idea, all the way to a person who walks in and says, Gina's Southern Gourmet Spreads, here's my full line of gourmet spreads, I've got every bit of manufacturing done, I've got it prepackaged. here's my gift set, here's my large containers, here's this, here's that, here's my distribution, and here are the 500 places where I am right now. Wow. Totally depends. So if you're on that beginning stage and there's a lot more work that has to be done, it just so happens the company that I work for is 360. It has everything from your marketing, your packaging, your trademarking, your attorney, client privilege, all of that, to your branding, your identification, your SEO, search engine optim optimizations, in case you didn't know what that meant. Um, all of that is done under one roof to wow. make you as successful as you can, and then I take over and get you into retail. So if you don't need any of those initial services because you've got it locked and loaded, it's going to be a completely different business analysis. The one thing I will tell you is my angel investor does not want to own a company. Hmm. So you're not going to come in and lose more shares than you have because that's not her goal. She was an entrepreneur herself sold her company for a lot of money. When she sold it, it was valued at $135 million. Entrepreneur, started in the basement of her mom's house. With what? With a cruise company. So I don't have to digress into all yeah, of that, yeah. but she created an yeah. online cruise platform that everybody's inventory was in one destination. It became so hot and so, so exciting to the cruise industry that someone came in and bought her. 
for about yeah. five times its value. Expedia for cruises. Thank you very much. So now what she does is she loves entrepreneurs because she knows what it was like to be one. So she doesn't want to take everybody's money. She doesn't want to take everybody's equity. She wants to help. But just which end of the spectrum? Does that That's good. help a little? That's good. OK. There's one question for uh, manufacturing. Now, what about the cost effectiveness? The reason people go to other places is uh, for the, especially if you're talking of a new product, you want to be cost effect effective. How do you keep that going with manufacturing over here? In the United States. Yeah, the, the United States, as you know, is very diverse with regard to location. So even within different states, you know, you have different types of production, I guess, costs. What our centers will do typically is they will tell you the whole analysis with regard to, well, this is mainly what your production cost is going to be. Now, if you have another alternative saying, well, if I go offshore and I do it like that, this is what I'm getting, then it's up to you to make the comparison. What are the advantages and disadvantages of doing the supply from outside versus here in the US? But our, our centers are not into the whole comparison with regard to other places. I mean, they will tell you what, what it's going to cost you with regard to doing within their boundaries. What we provide, though, is that our centers do not compete against each other. So if a center turns out that they realize that the cost of that particular sector is high there, they will tell you, why don't you consider this other state where probably the cost will be lower? So, but, but they will never send you offshore. They will only send you within the boundaries of the United States. But a great question. Uh, hello. First of all, thank you, everyone. Nick Rajpara with the Small Business Administration. There was a question about business plans. Um, there's actually cases that uh, we, you know, that we see and we find through our resource providers, which actually agree with Howie, that business plans are actually not appropriate at certain stages. They're really, uh, you know, they're not the best use of the entrepreneur's time uh, because there's so many things that are not defined and so many variables. There are other uh, things, other tools out there um, that entrepreneurs can use. And, you know, there are things such as a business model canvas. Um, there are vision boards. There's all these other things. But there are other tools out there. The whole idea is to have something that makes it clear. You know, makes yourself clear. Like, okay, how? I, what is my revenue? Who am I selling to? Who are my customers? Who? What are my channels? What are my distribution channels? Uh, who are my partners? Who? Are, you know. So as long as it's clear to you. But you know, before we used to say. Oh yeah, right. You're, you know, somebody an entrepreneur would come into a resource provider or come to us and say, "Hey, I want to do this." Okay, come back and write a bit. You know, come back after you're done with your business plan. Uh, that's we find that that's not really appropriate anymore in the best use of time. But do look at these other tools. You're you're with the um, SBA. Yes. So one little caveat for that: How many of you have ever heard of Score? Well. Okay. How many of you have not heard of Score? So SCORE is going to be your best friend. They have over 300 agencies across the country. They are a not-for-profit, and they are free for any entrepreneur to walk into your local SCORE location. They will assign you a mentor. They will look at your product. They will look at business plans. They will help determine if you need one or not. They will help to bring your product to fruition, and then sometimes they'll help to connect you. SCORE is, to me, the country's best-kept secret. And I love when I meet an entrepreneur, that's the first question I ask, is I ask, have you been to your local SCORE office? My company, SLC, actually has a partnership with SCORE where we require every one of our entrepreneurs to go through SCORE agency for that mentorship. It is incredible. So those who raised your hand, find your SCORE location. Can I just say something about SCORE? Um, I was sitting in that seat where you are just uh, not too long ago for the morning panel, and we went into SCORE, and there are other options besides SCORE as yeah. well. There are um, uh, women's business centers, there's mm -hmm. a small business development centers, uh, veterans business centers, so in my presentation I covered all that. Um, SCORE is great, they're experienced folks, for the folks that were sitting in my presentation, but uh, they're volunteer based. So there are, also other, um, there are also other resource providers that could also help you uh, with what you're looking to do besides SCORE as well. But yes, yeah, SCORE, absolutely, they have, they have a track record. 
Good, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this, my name is Cheryl. This Sellers. will be our last question. Okay, um, real quick, Howie. Oh, they can find us. They can find us. You spoke a little bit about Kickstarter. Are we able to utilize Kickstarter in conjunction with Amazon, Indigo, or should we stick with one medium to try mm -hmm. to launch can you our product? Do them product? all simultaneously. Mm -hmm. So. It's a great question. So Kickstarter is for products that have not been sold elsewhere. So it has to be a new product. You can't do Kickstarter and Indiegogo simultaneously, but let's just say you start on, you do your Kickstarter. Let's say you do a 30 day, which is the normal <laughs> time frame. You can then, I call Indiegogo host the after party. You can then move the same campaign over to Indiegogo and continue to take pre-orders. And the reason, I. And I think part of it, when you're making your assessment of which one to go with, um, look at the different, like Kickstarter is better at certain product categories and Indiegogo is better at certain ones, but <coughs> Kickstarter has a much bigger... Um, Database and reach. Yeah, they, they have more people that, that you know, go on Kickstarter and it's by a pretty significant margin. And I will tell you this, Indiegogo is much more um, inventor friendly than Kickstarter is. Kickstarter is much more backer friendly to the people who, who buy your product, but Kickstarter, it's much bigger and you'll get more of their traffic. So in my opinion, you're better off going on Kickstarter. This is its general answer, not everyone is, but mm -hmm. you're better off going on Kickstarter because you have many more people there. But in either case, you've got to bring people to the party. You've got to get everyone you know to buy, because that's how you advance in the algorithm, is by getting success early. So your friends, family, who they all say don't get their opinion, you want to include them on, the, on your journey before you go on Kickstarter, so they feel invested in your product and your process of what you're going through, and then say, listen, we go live tomorrow at 9 a.m., please buy immediately, and that's how you that's how you start gaining momentum and success and then get um, Kickstarters like endemic traffic. Please join me in thanking our excellent panelists, Howie, Dara, and Jose.